Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and we're back with another Total War Warhammer video. Today we're going to do something a little bit different. You see, we're going to go back all the way to Warhammer 1, which was actually quite some time ago. And I'm going to do a little bit of a hypothetical video just for a little bit of fun. Where we're going to go through the basis of what was Warhammer 1 and see how I would have done it differently in a hypothetical scenario. This is of course taking to account my 25 years in the Warhammer hobby, many years in the tournament circuit, reading up on the law and so on, and being, well, a big fan. This is a purely hypothetical scenario, but I think that Warhammer 1 could have been a lot better. This is, of course, being influenced by a little bit of hindsight by the fact that we've already had the series going on for a few years now, but more so originally how I envisioned Warhammer 1. Both factors will come into play, and before anything, I am obviously not throwing any shade to any developers and so on. I think what they've done with Warhammer 1, given the circumstance and the fact that it was only, what, a year's worth of DLC, a year and a half, it was done really, really well. But hey, nothing is really perfect. And yeah, it just can't be. Nothing in life is actually perfect. So with all that being said, let's not waste any more time and jump right in. I bet it's been a while since the majority of you have seen the Warhammer 1 screen, and who can blame you since the majority of the content from Warhammer 1 has of course been transferred to Warhammer 2 through the Mortal Empires campaign and made a lot bigger and better, plus obviously a lot of quality of life changes for each of the races. Truth be told, I still have Warhammer 1 installed in my PC, and that's actually for a few reasons that we'll cover in the video in a little bit of time, so let's just jump right on. Right, so let's jump into the faction selection screen, which in all honesty is so much nicer than that of Warhammer 2. It's just a little better in terms of aesthetic and just being able to pick up races and so on. Of course, Warhammer 2 has a lot more races and characters and factions, but I don't know, if something was brought in this line, it would just be a lot better. But let's not jump into that, let's talk about the game itself. What we saw in Warhammer 1 was four races at launch as expected, then of course a free DLC, which was Bretonnia, and then four different paid for DLCs, with Norska being the pre-order incentive for game two, though only officially playable in game one through the main campaign. They're not available in the Eye of the Vortex campaign and weren't available in the Mortal Empires for a long time, so really they're more of a game one race. That means that we ended up with nine different playable races by the end of the lifespan, a rather short lifespan for the whole game. And actually that's pretty good. It's a lot of different races and factions with their own aesthetic, playstyle, and so on. Yes, Warhammer 1 wasn't so different when it came to all the races because the reworks didn't come into play and so on, but you still had variety. But let's look at all the races individually and see what I would have kept or would have changed, and you might be surprised about a few things. Now, let's start off with the Empire, where we have three legendary lords. Emperor Karl Franz, Balthazar Gelt, and Volkmar the Grim. We'll leave Volkmar out until we get to the point of the Grim and the Grave, but an important thing to note here is that all of the characters here, regardless of DLC or not, have the same starting location. This is a common occurrence with all the races that were introduced in the vanilla game, but the difference between, say, every other legendary lord for all the other vanilla races and the ones for the Empire is that all the lords for the Empire are generally stationed in Altdorf. You don't tend to see them outside anywhere else. I'm not sure what Creative Assembly were thinking about when implementing Karl Franz and Balthasar Gelt as, yeah, you couldn't really give them any other starting location in the future if there was any intention to give them a starting location. Balthasar did end up getting another starting location in Warhammer 2, but that was in the destroyed province of Solund, which has not existed for a few hundred years now. In fact, it literally just cut into Wissenland and made a new province just to give Balthasar something else. So in all honesty, I wouldn't have gone with Karl Franz and Balthasar. I still would have gone with Karl Franz because obviously he's the emperor, but I wouldn't have gone with Balthasar. Hear me out, because I know some people are very big fans of Balthazar, mostly because of the memes and so on, but he could have been a good FLC character, as he doesn't have any special mechanics, or he could have been a DLC character with something quite special. It really depends on how that could have gone in the future, introducing some big form of the Colleges of Magic, because right now we just have the characters, we just don't have an actual 
mechanic or implementation proper. And given the fact that the Empire itself is so big, literally any elect account could have been added in. I personally would have gone with Boris Toddbringer and Carl Franz as the Legendary Lords, as both are very well-known characters. Yes, they wanted a spellcaster, which, yeah, makes sense because they were doing that with pretty much everyone else buying the dwarves. But I feel like Balthazar could have been at a different time and they could have introduced Boris or any other elect account just to have some different starting location. You of course have Carl Franz in the western side, maybe an elect account further up north or down the south, it really depends. But yeah, you know what I mean? It's just something different. Especially as to date we have, what, three different starting locations for the Empire? One in Lustria, which let's face it, nobody wants to play that. Two different different legendary lords in Reichland, and one in Solund, which is so close to Reichland it might as well just not exist. I completely understand why they had everyone start in Altdorf, not only is it very law friendly because all three characters are from Altdorf, well Balthazar is actually from someplace else, but you know what I mean, he rules over the Colleges of Magic, but also the Empire is really small when compared to other locations or other nations better yet said, they've got a lot more distance or just a different way on how their nations actually shaped to be able to implement different characters. But again, I'd say Karl Franz and Boris Todbringer or Karl Franz and Marius Lightdorf, those were the free elect accounts that you could pretty much use and they were the most well known. It would have added for some different starting locations and some different enemies at the very beginning too. Of course, I'm not taking the reworks into account here because early to all Warhammer 1, that was pretty much the standard more or less as to the change between historical and fantasy. So reworks aside, the race was okay, just that was the only issue. It was literally just the legendary lord choices. Let's move on now to the Greenskins, where we have two base game legendary lords, which is of course Grimgor, Ironhide, and Azag the Slaughterer. And two other characters were introduced with DLC or FLC, which is Wurzag and Scarsnake. Both of them had their own factions. With how the Greenskins were implemented, I think it was okay with the two base game legendary lords. Both are very popular fan favorites, which is very clear throughout all the times they were mentioned throughout Warhammer Fantasy lore or featured in different books. I mean, Grimgor had a lot of time in the sun by different means of law and obviously you know Azag had a very big plot point considering the fact that he has the helmet of Nagash. So I stand by the choice that Creative Assembly made with both Azag and Grimgore. The only difference is one thing. Okay, so yeah, starting position. Everyone kind of guessed that. Really, neither Grimgore nor Azag should start at Black Crag, though if I had to pick, it should only be Azag, and Grimgore should start well, pretty much where Azag starts in Warhammer 2 now, as that is a typical base of operations for Grimgore before he starts moving around and starts causing some havoc in the Darklands or pretty much anywhere else. I mean, it's also the fact that that's a really big plot point for Grimgore because he fights with the Skaven of Clan Mordor a lot and yeah it's just a weird thing that Azag got moved up there instead. Yes Azag does have some plot points there too but it's just a bigger thing for Grimgore so I'd say just switch them around and that's pretty much it. They should have always had different starting positions anyway, but that was pretty much my only gripe and that's the only thing I would have changed. Yes, the Greenskins did need a rework in the future and they got one in Warhammer 2, but that was something that we didn't even know was possibly mechanical or not, so I would have said that I would have probably had them implemented the same way, it's just how it is. I'm not a developer also, so anything that Creative Assembly did afterwards, that's all great, the Greenskins play incredibly well now, but they were okay for Warhammer 1 standards anyway. Alright, now vampire counts. This one's a fun one. So, base game, two playable legendary lords. Manfred von Karstein and Heinrich Kemmler. Both very, very popular characters in lore and in tabletop, so it kind of made sense to introduce them. We later got Helmand Gorst, which features in the main vampire count faction, more on him a little bit later. And obviously Vlad and Isabella von Karstein, once again we'll talk about them a little bit later too. But the main characters themselves, Manfred and Heinrich, very cool characters, very popular 
popular, as I said, and probably would have been the ones I would have picked. My only issue, once again, is starting positions for this race, and that's mainly because of two things. Once again, two characters with the same start position means that you couldn't have co opted with this unless you used mods. And second thing, Heinrich himself isn't a Vaughn Karstein. He's got nothing really to do with the Vaughn Karsteins, and he's very much independent. The fact that he starts in Sylvania from a lore perspective made no sense to me whatsoever. Eventually, he was moved by Creative Assembly, and even then, that is a decent location. It's not the best, as obviously that actually belongs to Constant Drakenfels, but it's better than nothing, and it would have been quite interesting to introduce over there, because, well, you know, the fact is that he is a really cool character, and it would have been nice to have a different enemy at the very beginning. Both starting there would mean that you're fighting Vampire Counts, Dwarfs, and Empire at the very start of your campaign, whereas if Heinrich would have been moved originally and started in Bretonia, he would have had a completely different enemy, so you would have a lot more flavor and more reason to replay the faction. I'll be very, very honest, personally I would have probably sat him somewhere else, it very much depends on the limitation of the game, but I would have probably wanted to have something in Southern Bretonia maybe even in Astalia, to give a very, very different drastic appearance. There is obviously no Southern Realms, but more on that a little later. But as we're fully aware, especially as the map gets bigger and bigger, more starting positions and more varied start positions are great for different races, as it will give you more incentive to play that. And I always had that in the back of my mind, which is why Warhammer 1 was kind of disappointing in that aspect for the base game races at the very least, until future stuff started coming in. And finally we have the Dwarfs, another race which obviously made sense for Warhammer 1, and two extremely popular characters which came in the base game, which was of course for Grim Grudgebearer and Ungrim Iron Fist. I would have followed Creative Assembly exactly on this with both characters, as they're both great, you know? They've got great lore, they were very popular on the tabletop, so yeah, perfect. The only thing different is at the beginning they should have already had the two different start locations, as this was a bit of an issue for the Dwarves. You had a lot of different playable area, but not a lot of starting positions. In fact, all three legendary lords, which ended up being there by the end of the game, started in Karazakarak and yeah, no replayability. So yeah, I would have just put Ongrim where he should have been in the Slayer Keep because yeah, and that's it. Eventually he did get moved there in a future patch, but yeah, it's just it took a long time just to move him. It would have been interesting from the very beginning, and that's probably how I would have done it myself. Now we can start looking towards DLC, and we're going to try go through it chronologically. I might get a few things mixed up here and there, because it makes sense for the video, and let's start off with the Warriors of Chaos. Alright, let's talk about the Warriors of Chaos. This DLC was announced shortly before the release of the game, and it caused a lot of controversy because, yeah, day one DLC, but eventually that got fixed to become the pre-order incentive. So there's not really too much to complain about there. To be honest, I would have probably done the same way, it's just how it works, and that was the common thing for them, so why not? The Warriors of Chaos themselves are a very, very popular faction. They were one of the most played on the tabletop because the Zinch Warrior build was absolutely broken. Believe me, it was horrendous. But we had three legendary characters here, Archeon the Everchosen, Sigvald the Magnificent, and Corlex Sun Eater. All of them are very good characters, and yeah, all popular, despite the fact that Corlex never had a model. It's a weird thing that GW used to do back in the day. Now, in complete honesty, I honestly would not have had the Warriors of Chaos as the pre-order incentive, or even released within Warhammer 1. Clearly, there was a framework on what races would have been released in the future, with the Demons of Chaos and anything Monogod related would have been in Game 3. And yeah, that means that the Chaos Warriors kind of lack on a lot of things. A lot of their big heavy hitters are actually monogod stuff, like for example the Juggernauts or the Seekers of Sinesh and stuff like that. So yeah, I would have not really added in the Warriors of Chaos at this given time. While they were a threat at the very beginning of Warhammer, it started becoming a bit of a joke, and, well, they're pretty much non-existence when it comes to Warhammer 2, so I would have honestly waited and had them as a Chaos Undivided alongside the Monogod factions, because it just makes a lot more sense if that was always the plan, where there was a Russian leak a while ago which kind of suggested that that was actually the 
plan, so yeah, it just makes no sense. Now you might be wondering if that's the case, then what should have been the pre-order incentive? And I honestly think that this would have probably been the best way to go. I honestly believe that Norska should have been the pre-order incentive for game one, as despite the fact that some people think that this was a last second thing, Keep in mind that Norska itself was, what, released a year into the lifespan of the game before moving into game 2? So that means that they already had a plan for Norska for a long time now. Norska itself is Chaos Tainted, but wouldn't have needed, say for example, what the Warriors of Chaos drastically need at the moment, like the Law of Sinesh, the Law of Zinch, the Law of Nurgle, or any God-touched units which would actually make them quite a threat at this point. Instead, Norska, how it was implemented, would have been a decent threat at the very beginning, and it would bring that first feel of chaos coming. With obviously two different factions playable, Throg and Wolfric, it could have had a third, as there is a lot of different Norskin lords that could have been implemented, and yeah, you already have that first taste of chaos. It's not fully chaos, but it's a little bit, which will give you the sense that something is indeed coming, but doesn't need all the specifics of following different chaos gods. They're chaos touched, but they're more undivided than anything. It would have been very thematic, as obviously this is the growing threat, and well, then chaos wouldn't be so bad as it is. Don't get me wrong, Norska is in a horrible place in Warhammer 2, but in Warhammer 1, given the fact that the map itself wasn't so large, they were okay, and that would have probably justified a rework earlier into the lifespan of Warhammer 2, where now we're going into Warhammer 3, and only the gods at Games Workshop and Creative Assembly know when there's going to be a rework for Norska. I just pray I'm still alive for that and haven't died of old age. Now, you're probably thinking as to what should have been the pre-order incentive for game two and we'll get to that a little later in the video. Don't worry guys it's not going to be long now, we just have to go over a few other things first. So let's start moving on to other DLC packs and first we need to look at the Call of the Beastmen which introduced the Beastmen very early into the Warhammer series. This obviously had two legendary lords, Kazrak the One-Eye and Malagor the Dark Omen. Two different start positions were introduced for this, with third later being introduced for Morgo the Shadow Gave, but the fact is that it was just one playable faction and this didn't get changed until game two with the Silence and the Fury DLC. I would have probably just separated them and that would have gone well. Now, there's a big issue here as obviously what happened with the fact is that the Beastmen didn't get a complete roster. We had to pay quite a hefty amount and we only got two legendary lords at start and an incomplete roster which was missing a lot of the big units. This we eventually got, but Beastmen without the big monsters was really pointless. As let's be honest, not only through lore fans, but tabletop fans, the only thing really interesting about the Beastmen were the big monsters like the Gorgon or the Jabba's Life. So why were the Beastmen and in fact the Wood Elves too so... empty? Well, there's a simple reason. Mini campaigns, yep. So a lot of development time went to the mini campaigns, so we're going to take a little bit of time to discuss the mini campaigns at the moment for both the Beastmen and the Wood Elves. Yes, it did affect both races with a smaller roster and possibly less legendary lords. I still stand by the fact that the mini campaigns themselves are absolute genius and they should be in the Warhammer series as, yeah, they're really good, they're small, they're not like big Mortal Empires-esque campaigns or even the Eye of the Vortex, and you can learn the lore through some big events for specific races and factions. However, I honestly think that the mini campaign should have been introduced in Warhammer 3, and if any Creative Assembly developers are listening to this, please try find a way to port these into Warhammer 3 because they are absolutely great and they're a good way for people to be introduced to the lore and have a different style of campaign. The fact of the matter is, it should never have been introduced with a race pack. Instead, mini campaigns should have been introduced with DLCs in the far future in Warhammer 3 where races are getting all their quality of life updates, they're getting more legendary lords and so on, and not only that, but if you've got a race but there are no other races of which really fit with it in a DLC aspect as a versus thing, it would have been interesting to have a mini campaign pack. It introduces a legendary lord, some legendary units, and a new campaign pack, which would have been kind of thematic and so on, it would have justified a bigger price than a normal Lord Pack and just have a better feeling rather than bring in a race and then, 
you know, not have the full roster. This eventually was tackled with the Curse of the Vampire Coast and the Tomb Kings, and we got full or close to full rosters for them, but I can only imagine what ideas they could have originally had for those race packs as mini campaigns too. It would have been absolutely awesome. I am a big fan of the mini campaigns, and I hope they do return to Warhammer 3, but never to introduce a race again. Not only did both the Wood Elves and the Beastmen suffer for this, they did have something cool, but many people aren't going to go back to Warhammer 1 to play this, especially since both these races have now received their rework, and let's be honest, would you want to play the vanilla style Beastmen or Wood Elves ever again after you've had the new style? For the Beastmen, I would have seen the implementation of the Jabba Scythe, the Gorgon, and maybe a another Legendary Lord. It didn't have to be four, three was fine as we were eventually going to get Morga the Shadow Gave, so maybe Moonclaw, Gorus Warhoof, maybe even Torox, but I think that the DLC eventually with the Silence of the Fury worked very well, but it would have given some different styles. And then most importantly, as it did become very clear to us with future DLC in Warhammer 1, have them all split up, like for example Skarsnake and Wurzag and so on, as yeah, it would have just been better to be able to co-op. As, yeah, you could co-op Warriors of Chaos and Beastmen, but sometimes you just want to co-op the same race, and we weren't able to do that unless we had mods or we waited until the Silence and the Fury. For the Wood Elves, well, their roster was pretty much complete. They didn't really have too much missing, so I would have filled out the roster a little bit with the little changes that they made and added in at least one or two more Legendary Lords. Easily, Dave could have been added in with Vol's Anvil or someone in Laurel on Forest just to have something so drastically different. The Wood Elves already had the benefit of having two different playable factions, that's because you could either go full elf or go full tree, and you had two different types of playstyle, so it made them quite good, it's just the fact that the other mechanics weren't as good, but I would have gone with having the Wood Elf side, the tree side, and then having maybe something in Laurelorn or Volzamba, like I said, acting as a in-between, not having all the benefits, but not having all the negatives either, maybe with some quality of life changes to make sure that it's just not horrendously overpowered. But it would have been nice to have a middle ground legendary lord, just to have something different and a different choice. You could already co-op, which was already really nice, but you know, variety is the spice of life, and being shoehorned into one specific type of playstyle, not great. Right, Vlad and Isabella, two very, very popular characters. I must say however that I probably wouldn't have implemented them, mainly because in the lore they're long dead, which yes this is a completely different timeline, but everything was already scrunched up so badly in Sylvania that possibly some other legendary lords in other locations would have been nice. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love these two lords and I love playing as them, but it's just the fact of the mosh pit there. You know, you have three legendary lords in Sylvania, and then you have two right next to Drakenhof. It's just a bit of a mosh pit. Had they moved Heinrich and not added in Ghost, that's perfectly fine, and that's pretty much how I would have handled it, so then Vlad and Isabella would have been perfectly fine there too. And obviously this worked out really well, because you now had the ability to co-op, but if Heinrich would have moved, then you would have already had that anyway. Bretonia's implementation, whilst needing quality of life changes that we eventually got in Warhammer 2, was absolutely awesome. I don't know why they decided to hand out Bretonia for free, but honestly, Bretonia are one of my favourite tabletop armies, so getting that for free was actually really nice of them. I must say I would have probably put them as a DLC so then they would be more likely to get more content in the future because they're still missing out some units and some stuff from the RPG series and so on but hey, he is hoping that we still get it in the future. Anyways, we got three Legendary Lords playable which, yeah, pretty good, you know, they're all... Barring, of course, Mr. Trident, they were all well-known characters and yeah, you know, Bretonia is a cool race. They could be a bit better and they still, I guess, deserve some quality of life changes, but I'd say that everything so far when it came to their implementation was really well, and in Warhammer 1 it was just a nice surprise to get it for free, so, you know, well done for Creative Assembly, I have nothing to complain about this. What could have been really cool, and I would have probably gone with that too, is add in the Red Duke as a fully playable Legendary Lord when completing a campaign as the Bretonians. This is just the singular character, no extra units, no undead Bretonians, and so on. I understand a lot of people do want that, 
that, but that could have easily been added in in the future when they do some sort of DLC pack with some special units just for the Red Duke. Vanilla standard vampire counts with maybe a few peasants here and there would have been just perfect enough as the peasants could have had a reskin and just had some removed voice lines so they don't scream for Bretonia. Though that being said, they could still scream for Bretonia because, you know, it's the whole thing about him wanting to take over and so on. This is also why I would have put the Bretonians as a paid-for DLC, which then would have probably justified having some dark Bretonian reskins and some dark Bretonian lords and so on, because that would have been really, really cool. And it would have added in another playable start location for the vampires, which would have been really nice. But once again, I want to say that I don't want to complain about Bretonia because we got them for free at the end of the day. And yeah, it's always nice to receive free stuff, especially if it's a complete race. Well, near enough complete. Considering how expensive that army was on the tabletop, to get it for free in Total War Warhammer was a very nice gift. Now we'll move on to the Lord Packs, and there's only two, so let's start off with the King and the Warlord. Honestly, no changes needed. I would have probably done exactly the same thing that Creative Assembly did, because it was a pretty decent pack. Yeah, the quality of life changes that came in the future did help out those two races quite heavily, and Belagar could have probably done without that really punishing mechanic at the beginning of his campaign, but other than that, it was a great pack. I've got no complaints whatsoever. It was thematic. It's exactly what you expected. And eventually when Queek was added in, he kind of ties into the whole race for Karak 8 Peaks. So that's pretty cool. The fact that you also had the Mutinous Gits faction, which is pretty much hunting you down too. I mean, it's thematic. It's nice. And you've pretty much got a great Lord pack. Again, it's not to the standard of Warhammer 2 Lord packs, but for Warhammer 1, no complaints whatsoever. Absolutely great pack. And finally, we have the Grim and the Grave. The best for last, right? Well, this kind of stands as my most hated DLC, other than the original Beastmen, mainly because I like the idea and Vampires vs. Empire is good, but there were a few glaring issues, so let's talk about that. First, Volkmar. Okay, Volkmar, great character, but once again, stationed at Altdorf, where he could have actually been really well done as a horde, and I think that as a horde, he would have been really interesting with a little bit of a crusade mechanic, looking out for any impurities, any corruption, not only chaos with Norska, but of course vampires, and that would give you incentive to move around and take orders from Karl Franz, Maybe something like that would work out really well. Yes, this would not work very well when it came to Warhammer 2, and it would have forced the Horde rework a lot sooner, where really we've only had a rework for Beastmen Hordes and nothing else. But yeah, it's just having so many characters right in the same location, that was absolutely boring, and there was no reason to play as the others, because, yeah, you know, you play as Karl Franz, you just build a few buildings, and you can unlock Balthazar, and you can unlock Volkmar. There is no reason to have another playthrough starting off as Balthazar, or starting off as Volkmar. Unless they were your personal favorites, of course, but even then, you get what I mean. There was no reason to play as the Empire again. Having him as a horde could have been fun, or literally just adding in another elect account, which might have a problem with the vampires. It just really much depends. I like Volkmar though, I think he's a cool character. He's got some really grim lore, and he would have been really cool versus, say, Bellacor. But yeah, as it stands, Volkmar as a horde wouldn't be too bad. Now, the big issue comes here with Helm and Ghost. Now, don't get me wrong, the implementation of the units added in was really good because those were stuff that both the Empire and the Vampire Counts needed, but Helmengorst having the same location and Helmengorst being an absolute nobody, I don't know who came up with that decision. I'm not trying to throw shade at anyone, believe me, if anyone from Creative Assembly is listening, I just don't understand why Ghost. He's a character which literally had two lines of lore, like not even that, more or less, and he's a nobody, whereas there could have been characters implemented like Zacharias or any other Necrarch vampire in the northern parts of the Old World, in the Empire or so on, just literally anyone else, literally anyone else. And not only that, but technically Ghost is tied to the Von Karstein, so it's just so much there. Whereas again, if we would have had a Necrarch character, which would have been in the northern parts of the Empire, that would have been a different bloodline. That would have been something different, and it would have still worked well with the whole necromancy theme, 
but not from the same location where everything is just so scrunched up. So I say I would have gone with Volkmar versus Zacharias or Wurserin, giving Volkmar a reason to hunt down these very powerful vampires. Right, we're done now. Well, not really. We actually do have the pre-order incentive for Warhammer 2, which would have been playable in Warhammer 1 in the exact same way. Of course, I said that Norska should have replaced the Warriors of Chaos, so what exactly could replace Norska? Simply put, the Dogs of War, the Southern Realms, the Border Princes, Estalia, Talia, these are factions that we've been waiting for for a long, long time, and let's be honest, we have been waiting now for, what, five, six years now? There's no news about it, and the best time to implement them, in all honesty, would have been Game 1 or Game 2, because, you know, their territories are there, they've even got some territories in the Eye of the Vortex, so Game 2 would have been perfectly fine. Game 3 is going to be very difficult, unless they implement the DLC that you need all three games to be able to use it, and that's going to piss off a lot of people, but I think it would have been really good, because... Yeah, there's a lot of issues when it comes to, well, let's be very honest, Empire clones. Kislev would have had this issue too, but I would have left Kislev for game free, mainly because Kislev needs to be there to fight against the Demons of Chaos and so on, and have a proper fight. So, in the south we have the Dogs of War, which really were just an Empire clone. Of course, we did end up getting a massively great mod with Kataf Southern Realms, but officially it would have been really, really great, and it would have just been nice to have that at some point. It makes sense to have that as a pre-order incentive for Game 2, where we would have them in Game 1, playable as all their main regions are there, then Game 2 we would have had some of them show up with the Eye of the Vortex, as the New World Colonies and so on are actually Southern Realms. The legendary laws themselves could have been very varied, and it could have been done in such a way which could be kind of cool. Say, for example, if you would have pre-ordered, you would have had a legendary lord for Estalia, one for Talia, and one for the Border Princes, which are playable. But there would have been a fourth legendary lord, which would only become available in the Eye of the Vortex and obviously Mortal Empires for the New World Colonies, which that means that you would then have more incentive to play them again as soon as they were re-released in Warhammer 2. I don't know, maybe that sounds a bit much, but I kind of like that idea, and I actually thought that that more or less was going to be the case originally five years ago. Well, I was wrong, obviously, but this is probably how I would have implemented it. But with all that being said, the video is pretty much done. It's a very different style to what I normally do, but I've had this hypothetical running in my head for a while, and I figured this might be a fun way for us to interact and have a conversation. See what you guys think, too. How would you guys have implemented Warhammer 1? I honestly think that the life cycle of Game 1 was actually kind of small, and it could have benefited from a longer lifespan, maybe a year extra, which would have mean, yes, we'd still be in Warhammer 2's life cycle and not moving on to Warhammer 3, but there would have been more stuff being implemented, there could have been more DLC, there could have been more quality of life changes early on, more starting positions, and so on. Obviously, that will never happen, but a fun hypothetical is always kind of cool, and I don't know, it just kept coming into my mind, especially as we're moving into Warhammer 3. I will probably do this for Warhammer 2, too, if you guys are interested, because it'll be kind of fun. What I have planned next is to do a retrospective of all the Game 1 races and see how they are are five years later, basically. It might be kind of fun and just do this massive kind of overview regarding each race, more or less around 30 minutes each. Let me know what you guys think about that in the comments below too, as I'm rather curious to see what you guys think. I'm trying to shake it up a little whilst we wait for Warhammer 3 news. And I'll be very, very honest, this was really, really fun. It's something really different and it's always kind of nice. Honestly, I actually enjoyed this. But with that, my friends, we've come to the end of our video. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, might I suggest giving the video a like, or even subscribing to the channel, as it really does help us out. In the description section below are various links to different social media platforms, such as Facebook, Instagram, and Discord. Also in the description section is an affiliate link with Element Games, where you could buy loads of hobby-based products, not just Warhammer, for 10-25% to off. Making a purchase using that link and also our special code, which is also in the description, supports the channel at no extra cost to you, which we think is rather cool. 
A big thank you to our patrons. Your support means the world to us. It's amazing that people want to help a small channel like us grow and get to our higher level of content. A big thank you to Gibraltar LUSC, Ryan Birch, Andrew Prince, and Okro for subscribing to us at our fame level. You guys are super cool. And a big thank you to Edward Yule, VS Fasan, Aaron Whitman, and Shaggy for subscribing to us at our king level. Honestly, we can't thank you all enough. And lastly, a big thank you to all of you for liking, sharing, and commenting on these videos. Honestly, it's because of you guys that the channel's been growing at such a great pace lately, so we can't thank you all enough. But with that, my friends, thank you so much for watching once again, and we shall see you all again very, very soon. Have a good day.